Weekly and welcome to episode 157 of the Weekly Weekly Podcast. Thank you very much for joining us wherever you uh, have chosen to do so. I want to thank Lorraine Hogan for coming on last week to talk about all things uh, wellness and um, you know the festival and all that was on only up the road from from where I am and um, you know uh, empowerment and things like that. And you know we talked we got a good discussion about mental health in as well, which is always obviously you know part of the podcast. Um, support us on buy me coffee if you'd like. We're it's all there. You'll find the links and stuff like that. Anyway, more importantly, let's get into this week's episode. Um, uh, this week's guest is a filmmaker and critic, and his name is Maximilian Lecane. How are you doing, Max? Very good. Um, I I decided to shorten it to Max because it said that on your screen. Yeah, Max really. Um, you know, Maximilian only exists on paper. I think three people call me Maximilian and get away with it. Okay. Uh, Max is fine. Max is what I go by. I uh I put the you obviously saw it. I put it up on Instagram on Friday, like that you were coming on, and there was there was more than a couple of people said to me that's a very strong name. <laughs> yeah, well, the story behind that is um, it was kind of a conflict between my mother and my grandmother, okay. um, and my mother, just to annoy my grandmother, decided to give me the most proletarian name possible, <laughs> which is Alfie in her view, and not even spelled A-L-F-I-E, it's A-L-F-I, so it's sort of a, oh. an abbreviated version. And then to compensate for that, she gave me the middle name of Maximilian, which is you know, such a sort of overbearing, imperial <laughs> sounding thing, which, um, you know, as I said, it looks great on paper, but sometimes it seems a little bit heavy even to say, and gave me the choice between the two as I got older. And I don't think it was sort of the imperial versus the proletarian or anything like that. It was just at a certain age, um, Maximilian, when I started making films or Max, um, was something which I could choose, something which I could mm. use for myself and sort of separate from Alfie. And now whenever I hear Alfie, I know it's someone reading off an official document. So it's <laughs> the tax office or it's, you know, someone else like that. So I'm kind of scared of that. I immediately tense up. I think it shows wisely to be honest i think Ma- maximilian's probably uh for me would be a, would it be a, i got i don't know maybe a stronger uh, a stronger name than alfie but like you know we all have our you know points of view on that i guess but um so speaking obviously about your your past as as it were um could you give us a history of your uh upbringing please yeah um there's no short version but i'll try and do the short version right. and the simple version <clears throat> both of my parents were of very different backgrounds but they both were born in Singapore, and they both met in the UK. Um, my father was Errol Lecane, who was um, quite a well-known children's book illustrator. He died in 1989. And my mother was a writer, and um, she worked at his, a- his agent for a number of years. And up until my early teens, we moved around an awful lot, mainly living in the UK. Then after my father's death, we moved to Spain and Morocco for a while. And then ended up living, uh, first of all, very briefly in County Limerick, but then in County Cork, in West Cork, on the Barrow Peninsula from the time when I was about 13. Um, And here we've sort of stayed. It was a a small family. Um, It's only my sister and myself left now. Uh, It's quite a journey, isn't it? Like, um, you know, to, to, well, especially for your parents, I guess, starting off and, you know, born in Singapore and then moving and stuff like that. I, um. I wonder. I've I've had a couple of people on Max who spoke about, uh, you know, moving around as a child, you know, a little bit, not you know, all over the top moving, but just moving in around different countries and stuff like that. And I wonder, like, does that you know affect a child? Because we always ask the question afterwards, and as you know, about um, you know, when someone became aware of mental health, did did it have any effect on you moving around? Like, you didn't have any kind of set roots. Um. Yeah. Massively. Um. And I guess sometimes as a kid, that was a little bit difficult, but in retrospect, I'm really grateful for it. You know, I'm really grateful for sort of being an outsider wherever I am. Um, Like I feel very settled in Ireland now and I've taken up citizenship and I, you know, don't really have plans to live anywhere else. And I'm kind of well embedded, but at the same time, I'm never really going to belong anywhere except maybe in the, what Orson Welles called the universe of cinema or the Mm -hmm. planet of filmmaking. Um, so that I guess that was sort of the constant. Yeah, it's 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 interesting, and that like that idea of you know uh, moving about, but the i you know the broadening of the mind, I guess, with travel as well, and like what you've seen, and I, I you know 
obviously you're you're settled where you are now and stuff like that. But like as as a filmmaker now, do you think that's benefited you? Oh, massively. Yeah. Right. Like all, all all the different perspectives, all the different different ways of seeing things, you know, encountering different people, different cultures, and um, just always, again, having an outside perspective on pretty much any situation I'm in. Yeah. That, and what, like, so what are your first um, memories of, of watching films? Um, I mean, it's, it's a funny thing, me and film. Uh, I think when I was around the age of 10, finally discovered that not everyone wanted to get into films which i found really surprising yeah. um like it, it, it's always been this almost sort of predestined preoccupation with film history <clears throat> and you know at one stage i would have said it's an obsession but that's kind of um you know that has a lot of negative connotations mm -hmm. and maybe obsession is part of it but it's more just a way of living and a way of thinking and a way of processing reality and especially the sort of films i make which tend to be very very personal um, it's uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's kind of like creating a zone to inhabit between inner reality and outer reality, mm. and then just a way of sort of negotiating these different things. So my first memory, um, and I'm, I'm sort of evading that question a little bit because it it it, it does seem like such a sort of um, standard answer. But my first memory was seeing Return of the Jedi, the mm. third original Star Wars movie, with my dad in the cinema in the mid 80s early mid 80s um i obviously seen things on tv before that and i have other other memories of um a lot of the time older films i i gravitate towards old films from quite a young age as well and that's that sort of remained consistent uh i i wonder how um many people have had that experience of of something like Star Wars and obviously it's something different now well I guess it could still be Star Wars now but you know something like Avatar and I know the sequel is out now and and or even the Marvel Cinematic Universe and that kind of thing how young people growing up will will have that as their first experience you know that that big blockbuster like my I don't tend to gravitate towards them too much the the, the bigger blockbusters and that but I don't know if I mentioned on the podcast before, but my first was uh, my first memory was in like a, an old cinema at Lone that's gone years and years now. But uh, um, I saw um, Fantasia and it was, oh, wow. yeah, I was a pro like I was really, really young and I don't really have any, you know, real memories to stick with me. But I remember being in that cinema and seeing that, you know, massive screen. And that's what it was to a kid. Like it's, it still is. But, you know, uh, uh, to a kid and all those vibrant colors and that sound that was louder than anything you'd really heard before. um, That's what kind of st stuck with me um, so much. And like, that's not to say that, like, immediately afterwards, I was like, oh, I love films now. I want to go after films. I didn't really get into them till I was probably in my maybe mid teens and stuff when I started to really kind of take them seriously. Um, how much like when you when you are, you know, when you were growing up and you know even watching films now, how much of those films do you absorb absorb and and kind of uh, they become kind of an influence on your own work? Because you did mention about um, a lot of them is qu are quite personal. Um. Yeah, I did. I, I think maybe just to step back from that, what you said is really beautiful about that sort of experience. Um, and especially maybe when you're a kid and you don't completely follow the, the plot and there's a lot of things which sort of elude you. But then at the same time, there is this this atmosphere, this sort of overwhelming mixture of sounds and images and um, feelings, um, which can sometimes be quite scary as well. Mm. Um, so maybe paradoxically, looking back at that first trip to the cinema, I think... I left, I asked my father to leave early. You know, I'd sort of had enough at a certain time, even though I really loved it. Um, and so it wasn't about following the story through. It was mm. just sort of about this experience. But the sort of films I make, experimental films, um, even for adults, it can often be the same thing. You know, people see them, they don't get them, they don't like them. You know, it's something different. But, you know, as you were describing with those, seeing those blockbusters for the first time, there's something about the experience that sticks with you. Mm -hmm. and sort of starts germinating and, and and brings people back. So I guess you no know, the, the 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 revelation or whatever from what you were just saying is maybe that that is the way it is with films all along. Yeah. It 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 is this sort of experience that somehow gradually pulls you in and brings you back and, and develops on. 
Um, I don't think, again, I don't really gravitate towards the blockbusters much either. You know, there's the odd one, which I'll appreciate for one reason or another. But what I do tends to be at the total opposite end of the spectrum. And there have been a lot of influences over the years and, and lots of sort of layers of influences. And oddly enough, um, one of the things which really um, brought me into filmmaking and kind of at that age, the films I wanted to make were Westerns. Um, hey. When I was maybe seven or eight, discovering the Western genre was a huge thing for me. Um, and it also, again, sort of put me in kind of a strange situation with cinema, slightly outside a situation in the, at that stage in the late eighties, there weren't many Westerns being made. So I was very aware that the sort of films I was really into were not being made anymore. The people I was really, I was really into tended to be dead by and large. So <laughs> there was almost this sort of ghostly or morbid thing about it. You know, I, I wanted to make these films, but I didn't really know if that was possible anymore. So that, that, that already sort of maybe set me at a slight critical distance from film and the idea of, films, um, Jean Cocteau has a wonderful expression, cinema is death at work. You know, you film someone and you capture that moment and the people in that shot keep aging, they keep moving on, but the impression of that shot can keep being played again and again and again. So you're actually seeing people age, you're seeing death at work. Um, that's very important to me. You know, this idea of film as being kind of like an analog to memory um, and sort of these images or elements of memory which you can then reconstitute in any way you want. Um, so I'm, I'm probably jumping ahead, I'm jumping around a lot, but the next phase of sort of massive influences was when I was maybe 11 or 12, um, and I caught a couple of art house movies on TV, um, specifically Ingmar Bergman's Through a Glass Darkly and Bernardo Bertolucci's The Spider Stratagem. And I didn't really understand them. I didn't know quite what was going on, but the atmosphere and again, the visuals, you know, again, it's, it's like, you know, as a three-year-old or a four-year-old seeing Star Wars for the first time again, almost now we're talking about it in these terms. There was something so powerful about that um, that I was just completely drawn in. I wanted to figure out what this was. I wanted to, to find out what this type of filmmaking was. But apart from that, of course, the fact that it was dealing with very mature themes and adult emotions and, going into places where as a person, you know, going into, <clears throat> into my teenage years, I was just beginning to find out as well. So it's like learning about life and learning about films sort of overlapped there. And um, I became obsessed with those, those types of movies. And at the same time, you know, just to give some context, I was living in rural West Cork. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't like I was surrounded by a huge community of people who were into this. So it was all about ordering VHS tapes and then, later on swapping pirate VHS tapes with people. Um, and yeah, and, and, and just sort of going through the art house films and getting sort of more and more towards the edge of that and into more overtly experimental work. And at the same time, sort of starting making my own films. Um, and then I guess for a while <clears throat> I went, excuse me, um, I got into this phase where I, I guess you could say I became very, very, snobbish or very very puritanical about what i was watching mm. uh which was great for a while you know it's really good to go through something like this where it yeah. comes down to only three people's films are worth watching and um, everything else is somehow compromised and you know of course the minute you start making films you're immediately going to the top to join these people or whatever uh, unfortunately <laughs> certainly not the case and then um, I discovered the Chilean filmmaker, Raul Ruiz, who makes right. incredibly um, Baroque, uh, stylized, um, feverish, dreamlike, but also quite political films, um, which draw on all sorts of different genres, literary and cinema and um, B movies, you know, a lot, a lot of, of very sort of overcooked elements. And that was kind of like a return of the repressed. Suddenly, you know, all the stuff I hadn't watched for years. And at that point, I became massively into horror movies and uh, science fiction, which I'd liked as a kid. All that came back and it was like suddenly permission for the floodgates to open. And now I guess I have very, very broad tastes and, you know, a lot of influences from a lot of different places. I was. It's funny, I was laughing at the bit about the, uh, you know, the bit where you're kind of, watching maybe three directors, like you were saying. And, you know, I've been accused of being very snobbish from from 
from many different people and it's and it's probably fair but i i it's more to do with with my just like for the for the blockbusters and churning up the kind of same stuff and, and and like like i say it's when i look at it the way we just spoke about like for a kid that might be their first experience going to see like thor or something and to them it's you know but to, you know at my age i'm kind of thinking like that's not for me i'm going to go somewhere else with it but um I wanted to speak, I guess, about what you you said about not understanding films, and I, like I I definitely watched Bergman a few Bergman films when I was too young to even kind of think or imagine what he was talking about, and I think sometimes, and I do it with books sometimes as well. I don't want to feel stupid, or I, I don't want to feel dumb that I didn't get it. Like, and why didn't I get it? I'm not smart enough. Is there is this for smarter people? I wonder are people a little bit afraid of that. Yeah, this is um, a point I feel quite strongly about, especially in relation to my own work. Um, the films which I make and the way I work, it's basically a process of exploration. Um, you know, I don't write scripts as such. So, you know, I, I often have pages of notes. Um, but the way the film's made, I basically know what it's going to be on the last day of editing. Um, you know, but, I just sort of explore ideas. It's And, and you know, I, I sometimes do look at, putting a film together as being almost similar to exploring, say, a ruin or something. You know, you walk around, you don't know what's going to be around the next corner. You put things together, you see how they'll work out. There's an atmosphere, there are ideas, there are people. Um, but then somehow how they finally get collaged together, how they cohere, is, uh, it remains to be seen. And it often does so on a level that's far, um, far more emotional than say intellectual, at least for me. Mm -hmm. And then there always is sense to it. There always is a structure to it, but it's often quite a while after I've made the film that I find out what that is. And from a filmmaking perspective, that sounds completely insane. But if you look at that in relation to say the way musicians improvise, you know, imp musical improvisation, then it suddenly starts making sense. And the fact that in music, you can have atmospheres, you can have themes, you can have narratives that aren't literal and, you know, you can just put them together in a way that does develop emotionally in a way that's satisfying and um, and engaging, but, you know, not necessarily knowing what all the points are along the way. And mm. um, that's kind of what I do. And I get, um, yeah, I, I, some people, because my films don't have a reg, uh, sort of very easily discernible narrative sometimes, people do tend to feel this way. Ah, we're not getting it. There's something. And if they're not getting it, then often I'm not getting it either, but it isn't that there's something to get, you know, it, it is experiential. It's, um, I try to leave the films as open as possible for people to bring their own imagination, their own feelings to it. Um, and, you know, and to, to sort of take the trip. And a lot of the time people who've seen the films, if they really engage or connect with it, they can explain what's happening much better than I ever could. I'm very good at talking about other people's films. I actually live in dread of the question, what sort of films do you make? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> because as, as you can hear, it's kind of happening now. When I start talking about that, it tends to sound terribly abstract and terribly abstruse. But, you know, if we're actually there looking at a sound and an image, then it can become something more concrete. But, you know, the sort of questions I get in Q&As, which I absolutely hate, like the, I, I had one. Not to, to pick on any audience member, but it did happen the last time I had a film screening in the Triscoll in town. Um, so, and, and the gentleman actually took out a notebook. So this shot, what was that about? And, mm. you know, I, I sort of ran rings around him. You know, it's not about that. Um, and I really, I, I get kind of sad when people see my films as being intellectual puzzles or something to which there's an answer, you know, there. Um, hopefully there are lots and lots of questions and lots and lots of inferences. And lots and lots of dreams and nightmares in there, but um, I, I, I'm really not about answers or, or puzzles. And I think I, I, I enjoy watching films that way as well. You know, I don't, I, I don't feel that I need to understand everything in an intellectual way. Yeah, and that's important because, um, you know, I actually watched a film this morning. I don't know if you've seen uh, Nitram, the uh, Justin Kurzel film with. Um, uh, Caleb Landry Jones. So it's a, it's a, it's came out last year anyway. But it's about um, Nitram the, is the uh, title character, and it's a true story about the guy who committed the biggest mass murder in Australia. You know. Oh dear God. But yeah, it was it was horrific. Like obviously, it was a, the subject matter is horrific. But what 
you know, I knew a little bit about it going in, but what what I found amazing about the film was that, uh, you know, I'm sitting there very tense throughout. It's an amazing performance by Caleb Landry Jones, who I think is is great anyway. But um, there's bits in between the 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 kind of obvious things what are where it's heading towards, and you could use this in in any good film, I guess. But it's the bits that I'll never understand, but the bits that they I don't even think the director wants me to understand them. Like, um, I've become a little bit more comfortable allowing those bits in films now. Whereas, like, you know, I, I, a number of years ago, I watched Inland Empire. I haven't gone back to it. I hated go it. Back, go back to it. <laughs> yeah, uh, don't go back to this. Just... No, go back to it. Oh, go. Well, I'm, well, do you know what? I'm going to do that, Max, because... When I was watching it, and again, maybe I was of the 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 mindset of like I need to understand everything, right? Like you know, uh, and Lynch is uh, Dave Lynch is can, can be kind of you know puzzling, um, to say the least. But I just couldn't bear it, and I got I kind of got through it. But what I'm what I'm kind of rambling on a bit. But what I mean is, I'm in I'm on that stage now where it's I'm comfortable with not trying to pick apart every scene in a film. And like you're saying, your questioner was thinking, what's this about? What's this about? Whereas you're not, it's funny. It's interesting to hear a filmmaker say that they don't have the answers. That's, that's interesting to me. Yeah. Um, I think the films I make, there's a lot of vulnerability about them. And I think in filmmaking, and especially if you're working in the commercial film industry, that can be a problem. You know, you have to sort of have all the answers to everything. You have to be in complete control of everything, but you know, I, I really rely on chance and, instinct and um, you know deferring deferring understanding sometimes if if there's a, a correct emotional response there like in, in in the making of the film as much as in the viewing of it and David Lynch is someone I admire tremendously I like his work an awful lot and I think the thing which really gets me most about his films is in certain scenes and certain moments you can see what's happening on screen and it might be something that's pretty disturbing and pretty dark but the sense of fear and, you know, this, this, this sort of deep sense of um, everything just being torn apart or whatever is somehow not commensurate with what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. It's like the fear is so much stronger. The emotion is so much stronger than what's there. And I think this is a, a lot, you know, a number of people sort of try it, but I think he's the only person who can really nail that thing, mm -hmm. that sort of nightmarish quality in, in that particular way. Like, you know, I, I tell people sometimes, you know, again, about atmosphere and things that the most terrifying dream I ever had was just walking along a brick wall and looking at a brick wall. And it wasn't even the brick wall and it wasn't looking at it and it wasn't necessarily what, what was behind it. But there was just something about being in that place, which was so terrifying that like 20 years on, I still remember it and I often forget my dreams immediately. And, you know, Lynch is able to to do that somehow in a way that's that's very unique and very impressive. Have you ever used that kind of fear of that dream in your in your work? Yeah, I, I mean, the way I work and the way a number of um, my colleagues work as well um, on a number of levels also because we're working with very low budgets, we're working with sort of what's around us a lot of the times. You know, it's about working in a way that's kind of documentary. You know, we're shooting locations that are around us a lot of the time or places we can access easily. We're using kind of DIY equipment in a lot of cases, but then it's taking that and it's looking at it in a way that feels completely different. You know, it's like taking it and inserting it into this different type of story. Um, and even if you don't have the, you know, the sort of specific narrative details of that story, it's giving it a completely different atmosphere. And we sort of talk a lot about the idea of um, what would it be like if an alien arrived on earth and, started filming stuff or even just started looking at stuff and started perceiving stuff. And this comes from, you know, the idea that a, a, an awful lot of moving image, an awful, an awful lot of image in general is just geared towards conveying information in a way that's very direct and maybe very easy, easy to access. Um, and I think that sort of brings us, you know, with the massive prevalence of moving image everywhere and imagery in general and the internet and, social media and so on and so forth, you know, it does sort of train our minds into thinking of things in a certain way and to seeing the world in a certain way and to feeling in a certain way. And if we can even do a little bit in our films to burst that, you know, to throw people out of that, even if it means disturbing them, you know, as much as, as anything else, um, 
we've done something which film is still, you know, it's it, it's it's still a kind of a very good use for film, which isn't done enough. We've 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 done the best thing that film perhaps can do in this day and age, and it's yeah. you know it's not not rocket science, but um, but I think it's very worthwhile. Yeah, I mean, I know you say it's not rocket science, but I mean the the scale that goes behind it for some people it would be rocket science it's like if you can't play a guitar and you see someone playing the guitar really well it's it seems like rocket science you know like Jimi hendrix or someone so absolutely yeah so it's that idea that like i I understand what you're saying but at the same time i'm kind of thinking looking at these films and images that are put together i'm kind of thinking god that's you know beyond me but um max hang on can you hang on one second i i just need to read an advert because i've tied myself into this at this stage max we're 157 episodes in and this is my fault now but i'm going to read it again someday i will learn this off by heart anyway fusion training center monksland at loan a place to train in brazilian jiu-jitsu kickboxing martial arts and crossfit a great atmosphere with experienced coaches and a real sense of community if you want to join the team, find us on Facebook at Fusion Training Center or drop in for a chat. Fusion Training Center, train like a warrior. So, Max, that, that's mentioned. beautiful. That 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 goes back to what I was saying about how more vulnerability needs to be brought into filmmaking. You know, <laughs> just the admission of reading something. If only, <laughs> you know, more of us making films could find an equivalent way of doing that rather I've, than. You were you were lucky to, to get a, a version where I didn't mess up because there's so many of them I did. But you know, you you talked about um, uh, Vicky Langan as someone you collaborate with. Yes, and, yes. Uh, uh, like in filmmaking, how does collaboration work? Is it a difficult thing? You know, it, it depends on 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 who you collaborate with, and I. Again, you know, starting out with nothing, making films completely on my own because that's those were the resources I had myself and a camera in my hand. Um, but then, you know, over the years, developing this into into a method, I haven't been in many situations where I've been collaborating in the traditional way with a film crew with you know different jobs assigned to different people. <clears throat> and yeah, I mean, I've had a number of very important collaborations in my career, and each one's slightly different. Um, None of them have been difficult, but um, no, I had to think twice there. <laughs> None of them have, have really been been difficult. Um, and, and the one with Vicky is kind of particularly rich, um, and we've done a lot together. And I think there are a lot of things about it which um, which people might be surprised to know in retrospect. And, and a lot of it, I think, comes down to what I was saying earlier about um, not having to have all the answers immediately. Um, like uh, we we made a feature film called Inside a few years ago, for instance, and that film has resonated with a lot of people. It's a story of this, um, and, and again, it's sort of set in this slightly dreamlike, sort of very completely personal space, almost sort of semi fairy tale. We shot it in this beautiful wooden house up in the hills in Kerry on a biodiverse garden, which was only a few few acres big, but um, it was up in the mountains and there were just so many different types of landscape within this very small patch. We were really blessed. We just went up there for five days and, and shot that with um, with Dean Kavanagh, who was the director of photography. He's a very fine filmmaker in his own right. And so it was just the three of us. And um, so this very isolated situation and there's this, this woman and she's sort of, um, going through she's on her own she goes through a number of personal rituals i suppose like you know she's she's very lonely and then um the way the film more or less develops is she almost sort of grows a man who's me you know she finds this naked lump of a thing in this sort of wrecked caravan next to the house and then there's this relationship which really doesn't work and it's just like my character's kind of a, a dead weight and um then at the end of it i suddenly disappear and she's sort of back into, and, and reality sort of starts falling apart a bit. But so it's a very, very bleak story. And a lot of people have sort of related to that situation of maybe being in this sort of dead relationship mm-hmm. um, where, where, where everything's, um, you know, just like a weight and um, everything's very trapped. And, you know, there were a number of things in that which were very, <clears throat> very deep. And we had lots of conversations later on, but we, the way we actually work is it's almost like play. You know, we just bounce ideas off each other. We go in, we do things. We don't really interrogate 
what the other person's doing. We improvise an awful lot. And then, you know, when you put a film like that together, it, it came out as something that was very powerful for a lot of people and very kind of heavy and dark. And then years afterwards, you're sort of stripping the personal resonances out of that. And there was so much in there that was, and, and this is, I'm just using that as an example. Mm -hmm. This happened with so many films, you know, there was so much that was so personal to her, so many layers. Um, but none of this was kind of planned. You know, we just had this idea, we had this instinct and then we enact it. And then, then it's afterwards, you sort of see the ripples on the water sort of go out and out and out. Um, and I think because we have this relationship, you know, we're very, very close friends, but we don't need to approach the work, which we do in the, the sort of overly analytical way. Mm -hmm. At first, you know, we can just sort of open to each other and there is a sort of amazing trust there. Um, that's that's sort of been the way we work and that's allowed for an awful lot. I I love the 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 connection that people can have, you know, through art in general, but, you know, you've heard of so many collaborations that haven't gone well you probably hear, hear more about the ones that have done well than the ones yeah. that have gone well but you, you know you work um you know uh, the experimental film society is another yeah. kind of uh, you 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 say you kind of hang around with them uh i know the arts council of ireland is another thing that's kind of supportive so when you when it's all kind of there there's so much around it and i know you, you you're still having to work on a certain amount of a certain budget but it's kind of a lot of, it sounds like there's a lot of fruitful ideas and, and people around you all the time. I mean, when, maybe just before I met Vicky, say 2008, 2009, um, and I was basically, you know, working my job and making these little films on my own and editing them all night and sort of got into this almost sort of stereotypical isolated artist mind space, but it really was a question. Like having gone from a place where I thought I, when I was a teenager, I'd be making commercial narrative films to this, um, you know, I, I really went through the whole isolation thing, you know, is this work worth seeing by anyone? Is it just for me? Is it? Um, and I guess much like having a very uprooted childhood, it's good to go through that and, you know, good to always have those questions in the background. But since then, so many wonderful things have happened. Um, meeting Ruzma Rashidi, the filmmaker who founded this organization called Experimental Film Society, who was kind of in a similar situation, plus being an immigrant, plus, you know, all sorts of other baggage at the time. And just realizing that there wasn't really a culture for this sort of things in Ireland at the time. And what we'd have to do is just get up and make it, you know, make the screenings, make it happen, create a thinking behind it, create a theory behind it. Um, and then meeting Vicky and becoming part of that. And uh, the Arts Council has been tremendously supportive, I have to say, um, especially over the last couple of years. It's been pretty humbling. Um, <clears throat> at the moment, I'm the UCC Arts Council um, Film Artist in Residence for 2023 as well, which was totally unexpected. And the fact that it was given to, you've, you know, you've heard the way I've been talking for the past however long we've been talking, um, it's very personal, it's very kind of abstruse. It's not really fitting into any pre-existing niche. I don't think I'm touching on anything that's particularly trendy at the moment. You know, and, and the fact that someone like me, you know, could get that sort of support really speaks very well of the Arts Council. Absolutely. Um, I that, So this is kind of the, the Ask Max uh, portion of the, the, the episode, right? So th this is kind of an advice uh, from you, if you will. But so I was out running. Uh, it wasn't too long before I got in touch with you, actually. So, you know, it, but it was that kind of cold snap. Do you remember that? Like we had a pretty cold just before Christmas. And I was out running and it had, it was still dark, right? So I'm running down. Um, it's a kind of a bog road I live on. Uh, but there's these big, tall fir trees, really great looking, you know. And I'm wearing a, a lamp on my head. And as I turned to look at it, I thought, you know, I thought I saw a movement, but it was obviously just the lamp that was doing it. But, you know, I looked to whatever and I thought like that's that would look gray as a like, you know, a shot, you know. Mm. So I ran on and I was in the bog at this stage and it was frost out and the moon was still out and all this. And I just thought like all of this is so uh, picturesque, you know, and I said, I have to like get a get a camcorder or get a camera and go out and shoot these, you know, scenes. And whatever happens with them after that, we'll see. Like, but just I thought we'd shoot them, and I still haven't done it. And it's what what 
I have this like block, right? So like I've written short stories, I've I've written songs, I've I've done, you know, being creative in, in small ways. But it's almost like I have this block as like you're not able to do this. And I wonder, like at any point did you have it or if not, like, what would your advice be for someone who did want, who is listening to you and, and thinks like, I can go out and do this. But then when they when it gets a nitty gritty part, they're like, no, I, I'm, I'm not good enough, you know. OK, um, well, for, for a start, I'll just go into granddad mode and <laughs> say when I started making films back in the 90s, that was kind of the very beginning of the digital revolution. And before that, um, you really had to shoot on film mm -hmm. to be taken seriously. Um which is a much more expensive business and, you know, much harder to access the equipment and so on and so forth. Um, so even back then, just the idea of just going out and grabbing something, grabbing some images would be kind of radical. Um, things have changed so much since then that, you know, it kind of is as easy as, um, you know, skills aside, I can't play music or whatever, but if I could, picking up a guitar and singing a song or picking up a pen and writing a poem, um, I'd say just do it. No one has mm -hmm. to see it. Um, get your hands dirty. And I've been making films for 25 years. And um, it still sometimes happens to me, especially in relation to like the situation you were describing. There's a cemetery uh, near where I'm living, where I used to go walking almost every day during the pandemic. It's a beautiful place. And, you know, unlike, say, the park, there weren't many people there. So it was kind of ideal. Um, and, you know, I was going there almost every day. I, just became so wrapped up in this place. And obviously I was thinking about how to film it and what context to film. So one day I took a camera down and I just found it so overwhelming that I just sort of walked through the place very quickly, whizzing the camera around, shooting handheld, shooting in this very um, sort of undisciplined way, just grabbing it, you know, with the idea in the back of my head that, okay, I'll get this out of the way, but then I can come back, I can think it through, I can film it differently. Um, and in the end, I actually ended up using that footage for something. It worked perfectly, you know, sort of like this disembodied ghost view of it. And it became part of a film I made. But um, at the same time, you know, when I went to work with that, I could have thought, you know, this is useless and then go back and have another go at it. Um, yeah, just, uh, just do it. No one has to see it except you. And you can delete it. You can run away from it and come back weeks later. And a big part of my process, and again, this is something which is quite different from standard filmmaking practices where people are really tied into deadlines and, you know, really tough schedules. You know, if, if you're making films with low budgets or, or no money, you can leave stuff for a while. And I'm a great believer in like doing an edit, going away and coming back and, you know, just sort of getting distance on things a lot of the time. And I find shooting is tricky you know even if it's sort of a setup shoot with people where you know properly lit with cameras all the like professional cameras um you can come away with the memory of what you saw on set and what you're feeling on set um and especially if you're editing your own work i find it's good to get distance on that so you can come back and see actually what the camera was seeing you know see it dispassionately and a lot of the time you see something that's but I mean, almost inevitably, if you think it's absolutely wonderful, hopefully it'll still be quite good, but it won't yeah. be quite as wonderful as you, if you think it's terrible. Uh, in a lot of cases, it actually isn't. You know, you were just tired or whatever, but but a lot of the time it's it's quite different. And it's just like rather than the idea of imposing something on the material, what I try to work towards is the situation where, you're, where you get the film up to a point where it's telling you what it wants to be. Yeah. Um, and it's it's always tricky, but it's it's kind of like this mediumistic process. You're listening to the footage, you're listening to the sound, you're asking where it wants to go. Um, and that, again, sort of goes back to what I was saying earlier, this process of exploration. If you're walking through a ruined building, why do you turn left and not right? Why this, why that? Sometimes there's a good reason. Other times you just do, you know, it's where you're sort of led. And then afterwards, once you get a sense of the whole place, maybe you realize that there was a good reason for that. Yeah, yeah. Um... I'm going to do it like, cut, you know, like you say, that's and I used to it's funny. I used to think it with the stories and stuff. And I'd always say, well, nobody has to read them. But I wasn't thinking in the same way when I was thinking about shooting the, the few images I had in mind. It's, it, it's strange how we work that way. Although the way I find with writing, it really is kind of you on your own and you have to create something almost just out of your mind, almost out of nothing. 
But when you've shot something, there's two of you in it. There's you and there's the mm -hmm. shot. And that can be a two-way dialogue sometimes. For sure. So who is the greatest director? Oh, boy. Um, That's a tough, it's a tough question. I'll, I'll, no, I'll, I'll, I'll take... Uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll give it a slight spin. Yeah. Um, can I do what, what are the greatest films for me? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I've been shouted at for coming up with something so deliberately obscure no one would ever have heard of them deliberately it would sound important by saying this but this is my honest opinion there's this french guy called philippe garel who yeah. emerged from like 1968 from that whole sort of tournament and he was a partner with nico from the velvet underground for a long time you know sort of really underground character and he's gone through a number of incarnations, but he made um, a series of films in the early 70s um, when he was a heroin addict under sort of really intense conditions, sort of very influenced by French decadence, you know, with, with no money. And they're basically kind of like portrait films of his friends, but they have this, this incredible atmosphere and this incredible sense of rhythm. They're silent or else, you know, in some cases with music, but there's, there's no dialogue in them as such. And there's maybe a very oblique hidden narrative somewhere, but it's just the emotional impact of these images and just this atmosphere and just sort of being in this presence. I've rather glibly sort of described them as like Andy Warhol films with heart. Which <laughs> I, I, I like Warhol too, but this, yeah. you know, this stuff really is amazing. And it seemed, <clears throat> um, you know, he really somehow hit on the essence of what film can do in this very simple in some ways very primitive but very profound way you know just in this this series of films and then then in the 80s he started doing more narrative films uh, again sort of all the time autobiographical stories and, and he's still doing good work um oh. and i don't want to you know just the fact that the work he's doing now cannot um you know equal what he did back in those days but you know i think very very little that's been made yeah. by anyone anywhere could so i don't want to be too hard on him for that um, so you'd have them as your, and why, like, is it just the the power that comes from them for you? Obviously, look, everything is, you know, um, subjective and stuff when it comes to film and art. But like, you know, I find it, I found it easy when someone said to me once years ago, 10 favorite films. Now I say easy. I, I you know, took a little bit of time and wrote, I have, I know them in my head and very, I don't think anything's broken in in the past 10 years, maybe. Um, but I can definitely note, and I think maybe because they're maybe, and I don't like to use this word, so I apologize, accessible than maybe what you're what you're talking about. I'm definitely going to go and look at them, by the way, because I, I, I like getting these kind of answers. But what is it about th th those film for you is that like that hits you so hard? Well... With those films in particular, I think what it boils down to, and this is coming out of years of thinking about them, you know, when you're a kid and you know there's something bad going on with the adults or there's something sad going on or there's something really powerful and heavy, but you don't know what it is and no one's explaining it to you and you're just there and maybe you don't have the tools to comprehend it or the adults are just sort of underestimating what you can understand or they're not ready to talk about it yet, but there's you know, there's this sort of immensely heavy and, and, and charge in the air. Um, and I think these films of Garel in particular really uh, sort of go into that. Obviously, you know, it's not from the point of view of a child, but it's just like being in this room with, this pe with these people and, you know, all this emotion. And you, you don't have the details. You don't know what's causing it. You don't know what the key is. Um, but it just feels incredibly personal and incredibly close. You know, it's sometimes um, you almost want to run out. You know, it's for me, it's 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 that intense. It's it's sort of that raw and that beautiful because uh, you know the, the sometimes they are quite dark emotions, but you know, a huge amount of love as well, um, and just the fact that film can be like this sort of microscope that mm -hmm. can can capture this emotion. Is, uh, is is really remarkable. And I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed, as you, you might have seen as well, with the idea of always going back and asking, what can film be? You know, it's this yeah. idea that film is still being invented. And I don't mean new equipment being churned out all the time, uh, you know, but just sort of going back to the beginnings of film, you know, because it's so easy with so much of it now, just sort of slot in with what's happening. 
but going back and asking the basic questions, you know, what can film do? And even sort of beyond, you know, the, the, the uses, which are very good, like say, for instance, making a documentary about a situation you want to draw attention to, mm -hmm. you know, but even, you know, more deeply than that, just sound and image and perception and, and these, these sort of very basic elements, because it's, it's still such a powerful tool. For you, like knowing what goes into filmmaking, you know, that in regards to the personal and, you know, the technical side of stuff, is it hard for you to critique other people's work, especially if you're not too keen on it? Um, no, not, 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 if I'm not too keen on it. Um, I mean, I always try, I, I think my basic um, impulse again, you know, and please remember this is, someone has gone from like only three filmmakers already good you know, back in the day. Um, if I'm going to sit down and watch something, um, I want to enjoy it, you know, even if it is, you know, so I, I, whatever, even if I don't really want to be watching it, even if it's something I know I won't like, but I'm being kind of put in that position. Um, I still like to be as open to it as possible. You know, it's tough making a film, which doesn't mean being soft on it, but it means sort of, looking and you know seeing if there's something something interesting there something i can learn john Ugoda once said uh, it's all very well saying this film's bad but what have you done to improve it <laughs> which i ki kind of like um but yeah you know as, as opposed to but people have different ways of watching films you know i was hanging out with my sister and her partner over christmas and watching movies on tv and they were really enjoying them but their thing is to constantly giggle about how implausible it all is oh, yeah, yeah with a lot of affection as well you know yeah. that's, you know that that's fine too oh yeah i love i kind of well yeah it depends on what i'm watching of course but like it's it's funny how we will allow if we're like you know if a film if, if it's by a filmmaker maybe like john luke godard, godard for example would use kind of an absurd moment in a plot we kind of let them away with it mm -hmm. but if someone like um i don't know who's kind of on there now the russo brothers or something i suppose were to do it we'd be like well i'd be like oh well, that's ridiculous that doesn't work but we will we will it's just favoritism you know with regards to who we like and who we don't like and we get very defensive i'm a big fan of uh paul thomas anderson's films and you know, people were having to go with licorice pizza and I was kind of, I hadn't even seen it yet. And I was getting really, like, really defensive about some of the stuff they were saying about it. And then when I watched it, I was probably even worse, you know, it was probably like, well, that's, no, they were wrong and that type. We do tend to, and we do that with everything, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. with you know, with most things, with music and things like that, where we take really great offense. But I guess it just shows the the love and the passion we have for something like that, with for that particular art form. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think the intention of the filmmaker probably has a lot to do with it. Obviously, Godard isn't trying to tell a, a linear story or, you know, sort of suspension of disbelief. But at the same time, it always amazes, this whole suspension of disbelief always amazes me, the fact that it's this sort of balance of elements which are so contrived, you know, by their very nature. And, you know, film is intrinsically just so, so fake anyway. Um, you know, once you... And I think the idea of film as being like reality, it can be like reality, you know, it can sort of get, take a pattern from it, but as a narrative thing, but, you know, even if you look through a CCTV camera, you know, what you're seeing is so different from what's actually there in front of you. You know, once something's framed, it, it is, it is already a ghost, you know, it's an element of which, which you can then sort of reconstitute, but yeah, just the things which actually convince people that actually suspend their dis. Well, a little bit of this nonsense and a little bit of that nonsense and a little bit of this nonsense, put them together and we'll believe that that's plausibility. And in 10 years time, that'll be completely different and we'll be yeah. looking back. Um, so yes, it's not a way of looking at films. You know, I, I'm, I'm sort of more attracted to the ruptures in this, you know, and to the differences with old films and to kind of, um, yeah, it's a, for me, you know, I, I I take it all as being kind of like this dreamlike madness yeah. or something. Um, but yeah, at, at the same time, though, if someone sets out to make a film to tell a plausible, engaging story, and that's what they're trying to do, and they fall down on it, they'd want to be doing something very interesting to, yeah. <laughs> to be forgiven. Yeah. Is there a, like, I know there is for me, but is there a genre of film that you tend to uh, avoid Maybe not so much a genre. I think I like 
most of them or elements of most of them um to an extent I'm, I'm always getting into arguments about how great musicals are which a lot of people have. no but i'm on your I side think, yeah yeah great um but I, I think maybe different periods in in film like but you know i say i don't really like new films so much and that's more a case of probably just not liking the general trends and things you know at the end of every yeah. year i've always seen you know so many really exciting really uh, really different, um, really mind-opening films. But yeah, but th they're all exceptions, though. You know. Yeah, but, yeah. Well, whereas whereas with, with you know, I can watch anything from the thirties, forties, fifties, sixties. You know, I'm pretty much you know anything that's thrown on screen, I'll enjoy it to an extent. But that's certainly not the case with stuff made in more recent decades. No, and like if I was to throw something like rom coms in, but then when I look through my my collection, I think the thirties and forties they were making rom coms that were unbelievable. Genius, yeah. Yeah. And, and like going back to them every five years and make, you know, sort of understanding more. They're just so crazy and so yeah. subversive and so out there and they make so much other stuff look really tame. Yeah. <laughs> they do and uh, yeah, it's you know, I think people get caught up maybe a little bit too much with how acting was different in the 30s and 40s and how it maybe changed during the 50s and 60s. It all kind of went a certain way with, you know, Montgomery Clifton, Brando and those kind of people. But, you know, again, it's what you mentioned about, like, the suspension of belief. It's not it's not real, you know. It's a, allow it to be dreamlike and allow people to act the way they're acting on screen because that's, you know, uh, the decision they've taken or definitely the, uh, maybe not decision they've taken, but that's how f acting was then. It was a different thing altogether. And pe that's again with musicals, people do the same thing. It's like, no, I can't handle someone. S someone said to me before, uh, maybe said a couple of times, no, I can't handle if if they, if they just start like a big number or something, that's fine. But if they start singing in the kitchen, I'm like, I, I won't watch it. I'm kind of thinking, but what does it matter if they're in, the, you know, th those kind of things that we, we, we kind of pick yeah. picky. Yeah, and, and you could say, why don't, don't you ever start singing in the kitchen? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And if you don't, I feel very sorry for you. <laughs> yeah, it, but it's like musicals are one of those ones that are overlooked and people think they're just kind of, you know, um, wishy-washy, I guess, and this kind of throwaway. But like some of the most spectacular films are, are, you know, musicals. Yeah, I was watching My Fair Lady with my wife over over the new year and um, I haven't seen that for a number of years and it's just incredible you know it stands up so well and it's such a sort of disturbing acerbic story and the dialogue's just so sharp and yeah the performances and the yeah it's just wonderful wonderful yeah it's the same as uh, Singing in the Rain as well like the, yeah. the dialogue in Singing in the Rain is, is, is mm -hmm. on a different level um, can I ask you actually because you did get married recently and um, it was a uh, how like an unconventional what what kind of no i don't mean that and i hope you don't take that uh, you know uh, as kind of offensive thing but it was a different kind of ceremony than ceremony than would be the big white wedding thing it was yeah it was wildly unconventional <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah my, my wife's an experimental filmmaker as well and um sort of part of the background to this is a film which we're making oh. about marriage and about you know the idea Idea of weddings and things this hasn't been properly announced yet so there was even sort of filming going on around that and in the background of it and we came up with um yeah we wanted to do something that was completely us and didn't yeah. you know, subscribe to anything else so we um yeah we devised the ceremony we had everyone wearing masks it took place in las vegas in a place called the neon museum which is what it says on the tin it's an outdoor museum for uh, neon signs um, yeah, it was it was quite an event. Yeah, because it's just I saw the fo the still that you put up on Instagram is where I where I saw it, and um, again we've had a few uh, people on who we've had a couple of people who um, what's the what's the word I'm looking for who um, if you're getting married and the person's like not the pr the priest role but not in the Catholic setting, do you know there's someone who's yeah. you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, the, the officiant was what yeah exactly, and we've had people on who who um would do that with uh, weddings that would be outside of, you know, the, the the norm or whatever you want to call it when, when to do with the church and stuff like that. So I'm always kind of interested in see where the ideas came from. But the fact that it's um a, a also, you know, part of the art uh, is, is really cool as well. Um, So Max, 
apart from film, now I, I say this might be a limited um, uh, answer because I'd say films are very, very big on uh, big for you. But is there anything else you like to do in your spare time? Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's like like film sort of permeates everything rather than sort of being limited to film. But um, yeah, I mean, I like walking. I like music. I like food a lot. Um, I don't have that much spare time. Past couple of years, I must say, um, I like traveling. Um, yeah, just the sort of things which which make life interesting and make life enjoyable. What kind of what kind of music do you like? Um, it's a wide variety again. Right. Um, I mean, I like um, classical. I like some rock. I like um, and and my taste again is sort of really expanded. Um, in like like there's certain core people like John Cale who mm -hmm. whose whose songs we had playing at our wedding, which gives you some idea. He was the only one, you know, Leonard Cohen, people like that. And then um, I went through a phase where I was very interested in noise music, harsh noise, and that sort of thing, which I still like and has still left a, left a strong impact, but somehow I don't listen to very much anymore. I guess I've softened a bit with, you know, with the years. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I don't feel sort of constrained to particular genres anymore so much. Um, I think film uh, opened up a lot of music to me because, you know, I think when I was younger, I was listening to a lot of uh, bands Um you know, pop rock kind of bands. And then I kind of became more and more aware of what filmmakers were doing with their soundtracks and, you know, the, the choices of songs for certain scenes and how they, how they, you know, almost like in certain films, the, the soundtrack overdid the, the, the film or, or over outperform, outperformed the film. And I was watching them, um, all quiet on the Western front, the, the, the remake of that the other day. And I, how was it? Oh God, it's good. Yeah, yeah. Catch up with that. It's um, you know, I haven't seen the original, and I look like I haven't read the book, unfortunately, but I haven't seen the original film, um, which I think is is a really great uh, yeah. and harrowing uh, war film. I I think they've done it justice, but Max, like when I was when I was watching it, there's this the score in it is just you know, um, how you can with two notes kind of generate so much kind of doom and fear in the, uh, in the viewer. I think it's incredible. And, and it, it just goes back to the power of how the two work off each other so well with music and film. Yeah. I mean, the f f music and I guess sound in general is such an underrated part of film. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's really a big problem. Like I often say, if you're into films, you'll obviously know directors, actors, probably no writers, composers, cinematographers maybe even editors but who's ever heard of a famous sound recordist yeah, yeah still you know sometimes it's almost like the image is just there to hold the attention while the sound goes in and does the real work um, i can trace it back um to when i started to really appreciate and it wasn't that long ago but when i really started to figure out that why it was so important rather than you know the music as well obviously like i've just said but sound in general and the effects that are used. And I remember seeing Arrival, the, you know, the Dennis, um, Denis Villeneuve uh, film and just the sound on the, that film was like, and I didn't even see it in the cinema. I, I wish now, you know, when you see something like after it's gone out of the cinema, like that would have been insane in the yeah. cinema, you know, but uh, Max, you've been a fantastic guest. I I hope I've answered the question as to why I wanted you to come on for a chat. Uh, no, but it doesn't matter. I've enjoyed this, and I really hope I didn't ramble too much. <laughs> no, it, it was <laughs> no, Max. It was an absolute pleasure. If you don't mind, um, actually, I should I should actually ask the question: Where can people find you and your work? Um, MaximilianLacane dot com. Mm -hmm. It's kind of all there, and all the different tentacles stem out from there. So, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm also on Instagram, and I post quite regularly there. But my website, MaximilianLacane dot com, is probably the place to go excellent listen if you wouldn't mind sticking around for two minutes i'll close this out yeah. we'll get a photo together and then we'll go on our way um i also need to thank john for doing the technical side of this podcast as always i always thank the same people uh my mom my dad my granddad jaron calvin and um, subscribe to us on youtube if you would we're on instagram like max uh we're also on facebook and twitter and then the, the podcast platforms spotify apple anchor google podcasts and some other ones that i forget um Thanks everyone for for listening and watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you've 
you're going to go back um, back and watch some films and find some directors that we spoke about and you know you know keep watching films because they are you know amazing really um and once again max thanks a million thank you uh take care everyone and we will see you next week bye